Hi, I'm Professor Matthew Schmidt, and this is Genetics. In today's session, we're going to be begin speaking about the eukaryotic chromosome. Now, we've made reference to chromosomes in the past in a variety of ways, but I suspect that I said something like, in essence, a chromosome is just one big, long DNA molecule, especially if we're talking about eukaryotic chromosomes. Well, in essence, that's true, but there's more to the story, and you see a beautiful picture of a eukaryotic chromosome here. But the way we see it this way, where it usually takes on this appearance looking like an X, when that's going on, there's a lot more than just a big, long DNA molecule there. So we need to talk in this session about packaging of DNA and how that gives rise to uh, chromosome structure in eukaryotes. Let's get some perspective first. So just for the record, in prokaryotes and bacteria, the chromosome consists of one circular double-stranded DNA molecule. Uh, historically, and even sometimes today, it's been described as naked DNA, the implication being that it's just sitting there and there's really nothing much uh, associated with it in a stable way. Um, the more we learn about it, we realize that the chromosome is in a region. It's not membrane bound, but it's called the nucleoid region. And there are various proteins and RNAs involved with gene regulation and expression that are sort of in the general vicinity. And they are complexed with the, the DNA, albeit not in quite as orderly and organized a way as they are in eukaryotes. In viruses, again, just for the record, they do have, some people are a little bit hesitant to call them chromosomes, but they certainly have DNA or RNA, and it can be double-stranded or single-stranded. It can be circular or linear. So viral chromosomes or viral genomes are extremely varied. There's really no general rule you can make about them. But we want to focus on eukaryotes. So in eukaryotes, there are a diploid set, meaning the chromosomes are always in pairs. The actual number is not that relevant. It can be anywhere from two to uh, in the hundreds. But they're in pairs, and they're linear. And if we wanted to look at, say, a human individual's chromosomes, we literally can do that. An individual's complete set is referred to as a karyotype. And the arrangement is species-specific. So what I mean by that, so this term karyotype is important. Karyon refers to the nucleus, right, as in eukaryon. The arrangement being species-specific, what I mean is, just take a horse, because I thought of a horse. A horse has 64 chromosomes arranged in pairs, whereas humans have 46. And you'd have to be an expert to be able to do this, but for example, when they stain the chromosomes with different things, there are banding patterns that are observed, and they would be different in horse chromosome 1 than human chromosome 1. So you can make certain generalizations, but the exact karyotype is going to be different depending on whether you're looking at a human, a horse, a tree, whatever it is that's eukaryotic. Well, one of the sort of conundrums or questions that's often asked is, yes, it is true that a eukaryotic chromosome is one long, linear, double-stranded DNA molecule. But it turns out that in order for it to, to really fit inside the cell, it's also complexed with various proteins. And of course, it depends on the chromosome and the cell size. But the estimate is that if you took all the DNA and unwound it and just extended it out, that that would be about two meters long, which is taller than me and probably most of you. Obviously, you have to explain how that could fit into the nucleus of a cell that might be 100 micrometers in diameter, might even be smaller, depending on the eukaryotic cell. But obviously, the length of the chromosome is much greater than the length of the cell that it's in. So it almost seems necessary, absolutely, that some type of compaction or size reduction of the space it takes to hold this DNA is necessary. So we understand this fundamentally, not uh, totally completely. So I'll tell you what we do know. Now, the term chromatin is one 
that you'll come across if we haven't uh, come across it already. Chromatin refers to the complex of DNA and chromosomal proteins that are present in the nucleus and very importantly during interphase. So if you look at a cell during interphase, the nucleus in general will stain darkly, but you won't be able to see the chromosomes individually. It's very diffuse and it's very spread out, and that's, there are a lot of reasons for this, but one of them is this, the genes are being expressed. They need to be accessible by various parts of the cellular machinery. So they're not visible at this point. So starting with chromatin, we can say that if we isolate that, which we can certainly do, and do a sort of bulk chemical analysis on it, it turns out that it's roughly one-third, one-third, and one-third, about one-third DNA. Now, of course, the DNA is the informational part. I'm almost wanting to say that it's the most important part, but you need all of it. But that's the part that the rest of it is acting to sort of compact. There are special proteins called histone proteins that are very important. They're also conserved, and they're in all eukaryotes. And these are basic, and when I mean basic, I mean as opposed to acidic. They're positively charged proteins, and remember that DNA is strongly negatively charged at its surface. So these, uh, for a lot of reasons, but that's one reason that they have an attraction for one another. And then what's left are other proteins that are not histones. These are sort of opposite. They're largely acidic, and there's a lot of variability to them. That's probably the part, those proteins, that we understand the least in terms of their specific role in making a chromosome. But let's think about the DNA and the histones first because that's really something that's well understood and it's a fundamental part of the compaction. So histone proteins and eukaryotes have a very intimate connection with DNA. Uh, as we just saw, there's roughly by you know, by weight, I guess, there are roughly equivalent amounts of DNA and histone proteins. That certainly implies some kind of stable piece-by-piece -piece interaction between them. And we understand that interaction, so this definitely is the case. So I'm not sure, obviously, if your class or your professor is going to need you to memorize all of these, but it's a good possibility. There are five types of histone proteins. They're all named capital H and then a, then a number. So we've got H1, H2A, H2B, H3, and H4. Now, I sort of just alluded to this, but these are really remarkably conserved and similar in all eukaryotes, meaning this, the amino acid sequence is very much similar, whether it's us, a mouse, even, you know, in plants. So this also implies that there's a long evolutionary history between these things, and it implies that there's a fundamental similarity in the way that DNA is packaged in all eukaryotes, fundamentally. It doesn't mean there are no differences. So let's check out what goes on and relate this to the levels of DNA compaction, because there are generally considered to be three fundamental levels of DNA compaction in eukaryotic chromosomes. And the most fundamental and the best understood of these is that association of DNA with those histone proteins. So I'll show you a, a picture in a moment, which I think will make it a lot clearer. But think of the double helix. So they say that it spools around an octamer of histone proteins. So in other words, there are eight histone proteins that are arranged in a relatively symmetrical way, forming almost like, I think of this like a spool, um, like a spool of thread. The spool being the histone proteins and the thread being the DNA that's going around it. So the octamer, eight histone proteins, the double helix winds around that, and that forms a fundamental unit of compaction called the nucleosome, okay? Now, you can actually see nucleosomes under the electron microscope, and it shows...